let's start with the fact that there are many Muslims who don't do their salah, they don't pray five times a day. And there are many Muslims that do pray five times a day, but they're not sure what praying five times a day is about or what it actually means. And both are deeply problematic. The Prophet ﷺ in numerous hadiths that reach the point of tawat or reach the point of being cumulatively trans, uh, transmitted. So we get to the point of beyond uh, a shadow of doubt as to authenticity has underscored time and time again that a salah that salah is the backbone of Islam and that man uh, that if if you don't uphold the salah then you effectively have destroyed the backbone of the, the religion. In other tra transmissions, the Prophet ﷺ have said, um, uh, the, 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 the key to the hereafter is Salah. And Salah is the, the backbone. And as we will explain, it's, it's, it's a backbone and the heart, the pulse of your relationship with Allah and the pulse of Islam. To me, a Muslim that doesn't pray five times a day, whether they know what they're doing or not, they're, they're, they're effectively emptying Islam of its heart and soul. And, um, you know, whether they remain a Muslim or not, I leave it up to Allah, it's not it's something that God will judge, but for me, they they become an alien uh, in terms of my feeling about their Islamicity. It's a, it's such a contradiction in terms of a Muslim that does not perform their salah, that does not keep up their prayer. Um, uh, now, of course, a Muslim that does keep up the prayer but doesn't exactly know what it's about is in better shape. There, there's no doubt. At least they are keeping the venue open. Um, but the, as Muhammad Iqbal once said, and this is critical for understanding the, so, the, the role and purpose of Salah, uh, Muhammad Qubal once said that the posture of the body determines the attitude of the mind. The posture of the body determines the attitude of the mind. What you do physically with your body has a direct impact on your intellectual attitudes and your perception of reality. It is a myth that you can perceive reality in ways that are unaffected by your physicality. Remember that Islam, the core of the Islamic message, is belief and practice. That practice alone is insufficient, and belief alone is insufficient. It is the balance, the complementary dynamic between belief and practice. And Salah is the a physical display. And I like what Grace said about breaking the inertia. It's, it's interestingly a very nice way of putting it, that it is a, a, a forcing the body 
to depart from our natural condition of inertia. And in terms, what you do with this body affects your intellectual and your spiritual attitude. But a step beyond that, you must understand that in the modern age, we, 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 we have <coughs> ways of measuring energy and ways of measuring magnetic fields and the, the like. But even before we, we, we adopted our modern tools for evaluating the way that what we do physically affects the unperceived, the unseen the, the, of, of, of the world. The magnetic field is unseen. Uh, energy is unseen. But we can measure its effect. We can experience its effect. The world of unseen is as present as the world of the seen. I mean, we, we know now that actually most of space is occupied by the unseen. The, 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 most of space is occupied by black matter and dark matter. And it's, it's not just unseen, but it even exercises very weak effects on uh, magnetic fields. And so for the most part, we don't even know much about it. The, so the world of the unseen is very much as present in, in, in your life as the world of the seen. Now, why, this is very important to remember in Salah, because Salah not only has an impact on your spiritual and physical uh, and mental attitude, not only, as the Quran says, that the posture of the body determines the attitude of the mind, but it even affects, has an impact on the space around you. Salah is a direct manipulation of space. So I can enter a house, and if you develop these abilities or you God has given to you them to you naturally, you get to a point where you can enter a house and you can immediately tell whether Salah is performed in this house or not. Just by the perception of energy in that space. A room that is trained in has a very different energy than a room that is not trained in. We physically can manipulate space and energy, and our physicality affects space and energy. There are areas that you enter that immediately, innately, subconsciously, you perceive as evil. You get an uneasy feeling, and you're not sure why. You feel you're in an evil space, and you want to leave. And there are areas that you enter in which that fills you with repose and with peace and tranquility. All of us have had these experiences. But we are very good, as Grace pointed out, that we're very good at overcoming our initial reactions and convincing ourselves to deny that inner voice inside of us, that, that innate uh, futra that God puts in us, that, that innate intuition that is in us, that informs us about the nature of space and the nature of energies that surround us, the auras. I'll tell you, and that's why I kept delaying talking about Salah for so long, because the way I talk about it among contemporary Muslims, unfortunately, um, is not what has become uh, common. <coughs> but <coughs> Salah affects even the aura that surrounds you as a human being. How or whether you perform Salah has a direct effect on your aura as a human being. 
and a person that can perceive this aura, or if you want to get fancy and technological, if you get one of these cameras that is capable of capturing a human aura, you can see it. If you develop the abilities, you don't need a camera to see it. But I can tell you that the aura of a human being that prays is very different than the aura of a human being that does not pray. <clears throat> and the extent and how you do your prayer affects your aura in very direct and unmitigated and ways that are, are not arguable. We only argue about things because we're ignorant, because we don't see them. And we live in a world of causality, a physical causality. But the causality that we are aware of is only a small percentage of the reality that surrounds us. I'll give you another example. There are certain areas, certain spaces, in which you look at the history and you see that there has, in this space, that a lot of violence has been committed. Repeated history of assaults. And you wonder, why is it that so many evil things happened in the space? The answer is because there is evil space and there is good space. There is clean space, and there is tranquil space, and there is demonic space, and there is angelic space. You, as a human being, what you do, you affect that space, and you shape that space. And you leave an imprint on it as real and as true as the fingerprint that a human being leaves on a physical material. And so when a human being commits an evil act in a certain amount of space, they affect that space in a way that could affect the consciousness of other human beings that come to the same space later. And that is why people who are susceptible can enter a space and can be influenced by it to commit an evil act. It is possible that if it hadn't been for the fact that a certain person lived in a certain area or a certain space, they would not have committed that murder. In other words, the space itself exercises, it doesn't take away their free will, it doesn't take away their volition, but it influences them in ways that are unmistakable and undeniable. So first you have to accept that. It, it, it's the same way that it, Iman Belghaib, that believing in the unseen is an article of faith. Believing that prayer is a direct manipulation of space must be an article of Iman as well. Because otherwise, you are missing a very important part of the entire dynamic and the entire process. 